cancer. Lord God, I pray for a removal of the cancer. Lord, for those that are going through just a difficult time of test and trial, oh Lord, I pray that you would be their portion, bring healing. Lord, bring renewal strength. Oh Lord, by your power and spirit today, we ask that this would be done. Lord, we know that you are the miracle worker in our faith and our trust is in you, Almighty God. Bless now this service, Lord. Bless the ministry of the word, Lord God, we pray. We give you thanks for it, Lord God. We give you all of the honor and all of the glory and all of the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. God's gift of family. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 gives the story of the creation, and it's it's one of those stories that you need to read again every once in a while because it helps us to see who our God is and where we came from. With all of God's power and wisdom, God created everything with the potential to reproduce. Have you, have, do you find it interesting that apples are still apples? They didn't turn into watermelons. God created an apple tree and it's still producing apples. Thank God. Amen. Everything according to its species, genus, family, and order, God guaranteed the continuance of those things. Yes, amen. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 24, follow with me. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind and it was so. I want you to think about the wisdom of God to do that. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind. Cattle according to its kind. And everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then after God created everything else, and I'm not going to go into the entire creation story, you can read it there yourself. In verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now here in chapter 1, uh, the writer is showing us what God did. It's sort of a, a process of how it happened. God is the creator of both man and woman. And he created man in his own image. God made the man and the woman differently than he made anything else, everything else. Nothing else was created just like man was created. Genesis 2 and verse 7 gives us clarity to that. And it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Only man of all of the other creation received the breath of life from God. Uh, I think it's interesting that God has the ability, he had the ability to have created Adam as he did a monkey or a giraffe or a, a bull or a goat. He could have just created us and life sprang forth. God could have done that, but after God formed man in his likeness, God bit down. I, I love the imagery of God's intentional touch on man that God breathed the breath of life into man and man became a living being or a living soul. The result of our life is because of that intimate touch of God's breath that breathed life into us for a period of time. The scripture really is not clear on how long this lasted because 
if you notice in the scriptures, in Genesis chapter 1 through about chapter 10, uh, you go through sometimes hundreds of years in just a few verses. We don't know exactly how long it was until God created uh, Eve, but, but God started with Adam and Adam dwelt in the Garden of Eden alone. And God put him there to tend and to keep it. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. During those days Adam was alone. He was made for fellowship with God, so he and, he and God had an intimate uh, fellowship. Uh, I, I can't even imagine what it must have been like for Adam and God to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. We, we think later when the scripture says that God would come down in the cool of the, of the day and he would walk and talk with Adam and Eve. There was also this time when it was just Adam and God. You know, there is a personal relationship that we have and God created man specifically for that. During those days, God, God brought every living creature that he had made before Adam. And Adam is responsible for giving everything its name. Now think about that just a moment. That was quite a, quite a task. I mean, it, 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 the magnitude of it is uh, so clear when you begin to see how many different kinds of fish are there in the sea. And how many different kinds of animals that walk on the ground? How many different kinds of snakes that crawl on the ground? I mean, you begin to think about it. It was a monumental task for, for Adam to name everything. How many days that took? I have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the scripture says everything that came by, that Adam gave a name to every one of them, called them by what they were, and God says, and that was what they were. I want you to notice also the authority that God has placed in Adam. Uh, it became obvious as Adam was looking at all of the different species and kinds of animals that he was different from everything that God brought before him. There were swarms of bees and flocks of birds and schools of fish and herds of cattle and elephant. There were prides of lions and troops of monkeys and pots and whales had their pots and can you imagine God bringing them before and, and giraffes had their tower. You think about all, all of these different uh, animals brought before Adam and Adam saw there's a man or male a female giraffe, a male and a female elephant. And man, Adam, began to realize he was alone. Adam had no one on earth that was like him. Oh, he was unique. I mean, there's something good about being unique sometimes. Maybe you realize that at your job. You're the only one that can do what you do. Sometimes that's really good. Sometimes it's really bad when you need help and no one else can do what you do. Adam was alone. He was created in the image and the likeness of God and it, it enabled Adam to have special fellowship with God because he was created for that. He was special and unique from every other creature on the face of the earth. Nothing was like Adam, but there's also another thought there. Nothing really could relate to Adam. Genesis 2 and verse 18, and the Lord, the Lord said, it's God's idea. It is not good that man should be alone. God said, I will make him a helper comparable to him. I want you to take note that it was God's consideration of man's aloneness. Man being alone, God said, I'm going to make him a helper. 
I'm going to make him a companion. Someone who is comparable to him. And the way that God did it is interesting. I, my mind has run sort of wild on this thought this week uh, on how God did this. Uh, he didn't start with a new lump of clay or a new uh, handful of dust to make the woman. He, he took Adam and he performed the first surgery. God put him into a deep sleep and then God reached in and took a rib out of his side and closed up the area, that sounds like surgery to me. You didn't know that God was a surgeon. Let's read it from the Bible, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. So God made a woman out of a rib. You wondered why women were so tough. How they can put up with so much. God took them out of the man from a bone and he made the woman out of a rib. Now God didn't take the woman from a toe because if he would have taken her from a toe it would have indicated that she was below Adam and could be walked on. I know some, some people in life have uh, that kind of opinion of a woman that they are second class citizen and that they can be walked on or walked over and, and they can be ignored but God did not take her from a toe. He didn't take her from a bone in his head because that would have indicated that the woman was above the man and, and that she would rule over him. No, the Lord took a rip from his side. She would be a companion, a helper, a help me, one to walk alongside of him. And I believe that when Adam saw Eve, he recognized she was a compliment to who, who, he, who he was. And she recognized that he was a compliment to her. They, they just fit together. It's the way that God made them to be companions one with another. And there's there's this thing that God has made that husbands and wives and families are made for each other. You see, when God created Eve, he was doing a whole lot more for Adam and for him, the human race than just creating a woman for, for man's pleasure or a man for a woman's pleasure. God was creating a family. Really, God was creating family. Look in Genesis 2 and verse 24. It's very clear. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's talking of family. Family is a gift of God. When you get past the creation in the next chapters, you see almost a repeat of, of this thing happening of genealogy. You begin seeing the, the way that family is developed. With Adam and Eve, they, they had, first of all had two sons, Cain and Abel. And most of us know about Cain and Abel and what Cain did to Abel, his brother. Although Adam was created in the image and the likeness of God, his, his sons were those first two sons were completely different than Adam. I, I, I've noticed that in families, have you? That some families, uh, it, it seems that you have a child and they're just like mom and dad and they're, they're perfect. And then there's other children that are raised and you wonder where did they come from? You could say amen or oh me or something. You, you know what I mean. Maybe it's been your, your situation in your family that, that 
you look at your brother or your sister or, and you say, where in the world did they come from? Why do they act the way that they do? Why do they behave the way that they do? You see that throughout the Word of God. While Abel did things that was pleasing to God, sin crouched at Cain's door. It, it's interesting, the scripture tells us that later, uh, at about 130 years old, Adam and Eve had another son named Seth. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Seth was in the image and likeness of Adam. In other words, there is, there is this godly line that comes up. And from Seth comes a new genealogy. In fact, if, if you follow Seth's line, you come to Noah. And from Noah, you come to David. And from David, you come to Jesus Christ. It, it's through that godly line. Uh, the scripture also says that Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. And I, I think that it's interesting that we have very few women mentioned in the Bible. Think about it. That first family, Adam and Eve. I see so much potential. I see this same thing in families today. It's really interesting to me. I, I could look at my family or I could look at someone else's family and I could see the, the heritage that was in mom and dad that came down to this one and that one and how this one followed that direction and the other one followed a completely different direction. From Adam and Eve, the scripture makes it clear we get all of the families of the earth. God did not start with another group. Everything came from Adam and Eve. Would you look around this morning and see your brother and your sister? They are your genealogical brother and sister. Every one of us. And I don't understand it how one can be blonde-headed and another like me. Uh, how, how one can be red-headed and one can be, you know, there seems to be so much diversity in us for us to all have come from the same mother and father. The next major family that is mentioned, though there are many other families mentioned, is Noah. The reason I draw your attention to Noah because Noah was a blameless man who walked before God and God established a covenant with Noah that everyone who is of, well, everyone who's alive today really gets the benefit of this. Noah's family is a great uh, in illustration of the impact of a blameless and a God godly life. Friends, if you will live before God, God will help you. I, I, I keep holding on to the promises for God's people that if you will live a holy and righteous and blameless life, God will give you your family. I believe it in my heart. Noah, the scripture says, built an ark for the safety and salvation of his family. When they entered into the ark, it was Noah, Noah's wife, and his children, and their families. You see the family connection. This is the thing that God is saying. God has a plan for families. It starts with a mama and a daddy. Genesis 12 and 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I, I, I want to claim that this morning for every one of us. But look at verse 3. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And then this phenomenal word from God, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Yes, amen. And isn't it interesting 
that this far into the genealogies of the scripture, we do not really have a clarity that every one of us belong to Abraham's seed. I mean, I'm, you may be, you may have Abraham's seed. You may be an offspring of Abraham. You may be a Jew or Israelite. You may not be because by this time there were many other nations of the world. Some were of Seth's bloodline and some were of Cain's bloodline. And they came down to Noah and then Noah had his sons and it's interesting in observing what happened then. There, there was this diversity that came which in that diversity we have Abraham's seed. And the promise comes from Abraham down to Isaac and then to Jacob and to the children of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And from the seed of Abraham comes David, who is the king. And from David comes a promise of God. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised David, he said, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Now, in short-sightedness, it would be easy to say that this prophecy was about Solomon, that God was promising that Solomon would come and God would establish Solomon's kingdom. But I, I see another degree of prophecy here that goes far beyond Solomon. Though Solomon was a man that established the temple of God. God had a different thing in mind. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5 gives us the clarity of this. It says, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. Who is this one that has prevailed? It is Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Judah, the son of God, who has prevailed and has become the Savior. I want you to see that this whole thing fits into the plan of God. Family is God's gift. You know, when you think of family, I don't know what your idea is. As we look through history, and I, we've been going in our Bible reading this last month through many of the genealogies, uh, and uh, some of them, I, I must admit, it gets sort of hard to read or hear. Do you know what I mean? How many of you, when you get to the genealogies, you just go to the next chapter? It's, it's easy to do that because, uh, but if it was my aunt and uncle and grandma and grandpa, it would be a little bit different. But as we look back at those, and I, I was reflecting on some of the ones that we read this week, it, it is amazing there would be this godly man who would have a very ungodly son or a very ungodly king and wife who would have an ungodly son and then after that one would come a man who was after the heart of God who walked according to the ways of David his forefather I, I think about that and I think you know it gives every one of us hope it gives you hope even if you have a difficult situation in your family that God is able to turn everything around the word family to me brings up all kinds of memories and images. I, close your eye just a minute and let, and let me say the word family. What, what does family bring to your mind? Uh, maybe your family's a large family. Maybe your family's one or two. Sometimes, you can open your eyes. Sometimes we remember when we think of family, we think immediately of mom and dad. And that's, that's the thing that uh, we think of. And as we're celebrating today, moms and dads, I, I, I think about 
uh, mom and dad and Noreen's mom and dad and the faithfulness uh, of, of parents. Uh, I, I want you to today, if you're a mom or dad, be encouraged in the Lord to be a person of God. You, your, your faith is not in vain in the Lord. The word family really to me brings back an, an image that I just really love. Uh, I have two different families that come to my mind. Number one is my, my mom and dad and their mother and dad, grandma and grandpa to me, and my aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters and all of us that would gather together. Specifically, we would gather together around Christmas time. And there would be, mom, my grandparents' house was a very small house, and so there would be pallets. You know what a pallet is, it's a blanket thrown on the floor and the, all of the grandkids and aunts and uncles, there wasn't enough beds even for aunts and uncles, so some of them got to sleep on the floor. Uh, we didn't even divide back then to boys in this room and girls in this room. We just, there wasn't room for that. All of the kids sleep in the living room. We've devolved out. And I also think about Noreen's family and the many times that we would gather around uh, together in her mother's house and the brothers and sisters and uh, me. 30, 40 people, and they're all talking at once. <laughs> That's the way her family is, and I've, all, I've often wondered, how can you get anything out of any of it because there's so many people talking at the same time? And she says, it's just because we're smart. <laughs> but I think of family, and I think of heritage, and I think of legacy, but more than that, I think of love and I think of care and joy and laughing and, and fun together. And I, I think of a, an environment where there is no condemnation, where, where you don't have to be perfect to be accepted. Uh, you don't have to have all of the answers. You, you just have to be you because you're part of the family. That's a wonderful thing. When I think of family, my, my memory comes to being in church together. Uh, my family and Noreen's family worship together. In fact, yesterday I did some video editing for uh, Noreen's family videos in 1995. Uh, our, her family met together. Her family, everybody sings and plays musical instruments. So we had a Bill Gaither kind of singing with the family and got every one of them on video with them, them singing. And it, it was like going to church, but it was just family. And one of the wonderful things about family is when you sing, you know there's not going to be any condemnation if you mess up. That's family. Your family experience may be different than mine. We, we really have diverse families here. In, in fact, when I married Noreen, I, my family is two sisters, a brother, and me. Her family is seven, plus the in-laws, and it's totally different. Her mother had how many in her family? 17, 17 brothers and sisters. Whew. I think about family. Some of us have parents and grandparents and even great grandparents that were good and righteous people. And some, some of you may be first generation believers and you, you're the only one in your family that, that is serving God the way that you serve God. You know, when we think about that, some, some, for me, 
I remember all the way back to the earliest time when I first started reading. My mama would tell me every night, read your Bible and pray before you go to bed. It wasn't just something that I, I did with mom and dad and, you know, they did it and I just followed that. Mom wanted me to develop a relationship with God and to read the Word of God myself. Family means so many things. We have so many diverse experiences. You know, we learn so many things from our family, from our mother and our dad. When I scroll through the Word of God, I, I see such diverse family dynamics. Some of these people were faithful and righteous people and some were very unrighteous. David, let me look at David again. David was a man, the scripture says, after God's own heart. And Solomon, his son, built the temple of God. David had another son who broke his heart. Back in the Old Testament, Ahaziah became king of Judah and followed the evil ways of his father Ahab. Second Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 3, it says, His mother Athaliah encouraged Ahaziah in doing wrong. Can you imagine a mother encouraging their child to do evil? Can't get my mind around it. When Ahaziah died, his mother arose and murdered all of the royal heirs. Think about that. That's my mom, the murderer. Joash, the son of Ahaziah, was hidden by his aunt so he would not be murdered. Joash became king, and the scripture says Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't it interesting that Joash could look back and say, Look, I have nothing to come from, but God, look what the Lord has done in my life. The scripture says Job was a righteous man who was blameless and upright, in his, but his children liked to party. You know what that means, don't you? They liked to throw a feast and get drunk, and they did all kinds of things. And the scripture says Job regularly prayed and sacrificed for his children. You see, that's what godly parents do when they see their children that are wayward, they are always looking at them and saying, oh God, intervene for my children. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 31, Jesus in, in, introduced a different kind of family, the family of God. I want you to see this. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent to him calling him Jesus and a multitude was sitting around him and they said to him look your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you but he answered them saying who is my mother and my brothers are my brothers and he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the family of faith. I told you to do it earlier, I asked you to do it, to look around. In this house today, we have brothers and sisters. Right. We are family. In fact, I have a look back in preparing this and there are many people in my life I won't mention any of them because I'm sure I would miss many who have elevated in my mind they are truly brothers and sisters we have shared together and prayed together and cried together and care about one another we're family we have been made 
the family of God, yes. you and I. It's a wonderful thing. Will you stand with me? Sing with me. I'm so glad.